Well, greeting everybody. Uh, welcome to Speaking with Clarity uh, for the next, I don't know, little bit. I'm going to be doing some snippets here, uh, probably at home in my room over the garage, um, a, a series of videos really designed to strengthen my local church. And so for those of you in other places who are watching, I hope it helps you as well. But I need to speak plainly in some things and, and I'll, I like to do them in church as well, but I want to have some things on record, easily accessible so that people don't have to wander to find, to find what, we, what our views are on some, on some things. So I wanna speak with clarity. I've come to some understanding recently that uh, I've not been as clear as I need to be, maybe a little bit out of fear uh, of loss, but that uh, you know, is not the way a leader should operate. I should uh, be clear and bold as well as loving as it relates to God's word. And uh, in my precious church, CRCC, we've just gone through so much of the last five years, uh, primarily for three reasons. One, how we look at scripture, I think, uh, has really impacted us in, in, in some ways that I want to try to deal with here for a few moments. Uh, two, uh, how we look at women in ministry, uh, which has been a really, really big issue in our church. And I've really been hesitant to say much about it because it is so volatile and because there are people that I love that disagree with me, but I'm, 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 I'm so pushed right now that I don't really have a choice but to get things on record and, and really start to talk about some of these things a little bit more, hopefully with love and grace. And three, head covering. You know, we gotta go back to that because it, five years after I preached the message on head covering, it remains a controversial issue. And people are, you know, you know just feel burdened by it and all these things. And, and I just, we need to go back over and talk about it. And then there's some other things. And so in this whole speaking uh, with clarity uh, kind of series of posts, uh, we're just gonna be talking through. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not infallible, I make mistakes, but I at least want to speak with enough clarity so that people who wanna join with what we're doing at least know, right? And at least hopefully hear a heart and, and a love that flows out of the word of God uh, that blesses them. And so I thought I'd start tonight with just how we, or today, depending on when you're watching this, but just how we look at scriptures. Take a look at this with me uh, just real fast. Um, this is some teaching that I've done uh, previously. And I wanted to talk about the authority of scripture a little bit. Now, if there are any typos on here, uh, forgive me. But, you know, there's really three ways to look at the Bible. Uh, either you see scripture as a, neither authoritative nor binding, which means that uh, binding, of course, means that it's mandatory, that we have to obey God's word. Um, and this view says that the Bible is not alone in containing truth. Sadly, um, the scripture, therefore, has no special authority to command or conform behavior. That's a view that people hold, even in the church, that, yeah, it's just a Bible is just a book of, of nice sounding things and some good principles. But let's not get too wrapped around trying to be obedient. The second view is that the Bible is authoritative, but not binding. That means it, did, it does come from God, right? It is inspired, uh, but, you know, it says some things that are a little out of touch, a little out of date. And I, I notice that this view, elements of this view come out, particularly when scripture says things that um, uh, really smash and mash up against contemporary culture and things that we, that we love or things that we're used to. And so uh, someone may not say that they hold that view, that scripture is authoritative but not binding, but then there are parts of scripture where they'll call not binding, just kind of arbitrarily with no real exegetical reason. And then third, scripture is authoritative and binding, you know, which means when it's you know, rightly and properly interpreted with good hermeneutics, uh, we as, as God's creations must obey what he says. It's authoritative in that he wrote it, it's binding in that he calls us to obey it. All scripture is indeed inspired by God, but it is also profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and so on. And so over the last many years, you know, we are firmly in the third category, that scripture is authoritative and binding. And, uh, and over the last several years, this is, uh, has been an interesting journey for us, particularly as we've, walked, as we've walked line by line through large portions of the Bible. And, and as a result of some of that expository stuff, really gotten ourselves into a pickle sometimes. I mean, literally, I'm just speaking plainly, speaking with clarity. I've lost friends over just teaching through the Bible. I mean, it's, I, I'm astounded by that, but it's the truth. And our church has been impacted by it as well. And I don't actually think I've led all that well here. I think I kind of hit my head under a rock in some ways, and I apologize to you all for that. But 
The question is, what view do you hold, CRCC and brothers and sisters out there? What view do you hold? Where do you fall in this group? Because if you're like me and you're in the third group, listen very carefully, then our first response to a text, particularly a New Testament text where the particulars of the church and, and our particulars are the same, i.e. we're in a church, we're human beings, we're married, we have children, you know, or whatever. Uh, I'm not talking about the Romans, right? I'm talking about, you know, just life particulars are the same. And those verses apply to us just as it applied to its first, those, the first century uh, hearers who heard it. And so that's why we go in and, and a word may be to the, the Ephesians, but we, we treat that word like it's to us too, unless it's obviously not. Well, like when Paul is talking about, you know, bring, the, bring my cloak from this place or bring my parchments from this place or something like that. It's obviously a closing kind of personal thing, but the rest of it is very clearly for us. Uh, and so for those of us who are in that third group, you know, it's, it's important that we, um, you know, that we study, that to show ourselves approved, um, but that we also walk in obedience. And as I have maybe assumed that a lot of us are in the third group, I've just kind of assumed that maybe we, we could inspire one another. We're all in different places, but inspire one another towards obedience. And, um, and so I want to speak on a little, a little bit about the, the authority of scripture tonight. Um, in the first view, Scripture is seen as more a conversation and God more like a motivational speaker. Um, this person, the person who holds this view, selects verses that makes them feel good and rejects laws, precepts, and most forms of accountability. In the second view, Scripture is read more like medication and God's seen as a doctor. Uh, this person strongly believes in the power, to God, the power of God to heal, deliver, set free, and stands vigorously on those things, but they often, uh, and they often love worship as well. But this person, as in the first view, struggles with, if not outright rejects the word when it is seen to limit them and what they feel called to do in life. And so it, and it starts bumping into our, our feelings um, and then we really start to struggle. Finally, the one who heard, holds the third view sees scripture not just as medication, but as regulation. In this worldview, God is more than a motivator or a doctor, but he is king and judge know me a little bit, you know I'm right there. He is king and he is judge and his precepts and his commandments, they're not meant to hurt us, but they are meant to help us. Limit what seems like limitations uh, in the word of God for this worldview are actually liberations. And so when he says, do this or don't do this, it liberates us to be the people God wants to be, uh, wants us to be. And so this, these aren't harmful or hurtful things at all. Um, and so the king's word then begins to regulate in this person's mind who holds the third view, everything in their lives, just as it regulates creation. You know, home, church, and state is the, the three jurisdictions that we often talk about in our church. And from uh, this person's view, the Bible regulates it all. And so this person sees the word of God like the psalmist. The law of the Lord is perfect, perfect. Converting, it's always smile when I read that because it's so true. The testimony of the Lord is sure making the wise simple, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring for, uh, forever, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, and they should be desired even more than gold, yea, than much fine gold. It's just a beautiful text you see there. And so one of the texts that we also look at when we're considering what view of scripture we hold is a very popular, very common, 2 Timothy 3, uh, verses 16 through 17, all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There's a quote here that you could probably read on your screen by one of my favorite commentators, William McDonald. Uh, but this is what scripture says about itself, that it's profitable for doctrine. So this is where we get our doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. Sometimes it has to come in and, and change us. It's profitable for correction. Sometimes it hits us over the head and, and to get us right. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. This is where we learn how to be holy, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And of course, it applies to preachers and men of God from that perspective, but the man of God also would be both male and female. It applies to all of us um, as it relates to how we view scripture and how we hold it in our view. This is a high view of the Bible. That is that these 66 books are inspired and infallible, inerrant, and indeed sufficient. This verse 
teaches sufficiency as well as inspiration, right? And so we go to the Bible to find out how to be husbands and wives and single people and worshipers and so forth. We go to the Bible. And because our view is so high and because scripture is authoritative and binding, our first response is not no. We're not looking for ways out of stuff, which has really hurt our church in my opinion. But our first response is yes, Lord, yes. Now, is everybody on different pla- in different places and on different levels and, and have different experiences? Certainly, certainly. But, um, but at a minimum, there ought to be this desire this desire to say yes to scripture, right? Yes, right, to what it say. Yes, yes, and yes. And it's just a beautiful thing. It sets us up for such unity and such power. And um, so uh, that's that verse, it's a very powerful verse. Another, Second Peter 1, where the apostle Peter says that we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we were made known unto you, uh, when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were our witnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And then he says, we also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy where undo, whereunto ye do well to take heed as a light shineth in a dark place. Oh my goodness. Do we need the light of the word of God shining right now? And and boy, does the church of Jesus Christ need to take heed, to hold to what it says with love and grace. Look, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible that we hold in our hands, we believe, is is inspired by God, is written down uh, by men, but under the unction of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why we call it the Holy Bible. Its words are given to us by God himself, which is why, again, him being king, creator, judge, our first response is yes. Our first response to repentance should be yes. Our first response to forgiveness should be yes. Our first response to some of the more culturally difficult things should still be yes. So years ago, after teaching on this verse, I said that God is calling the church to abandon worldliness and go back to scripture. I said that revival lies on the other side of such obedience uh, as it always has, but the problem is few people want to take that call, you know, to few people want to go back in other words, and revive. I've even wrote a book about this and said that we're in a pickle because the things that, we're, that we need to do to see revival are the things that we hate the most. And so we really, it's a real bad catch uh, 22. And then there's some information here. I'll just let it kind of scroll up the screen as to why, you know, some of the apologetic stuff. Uh, this is some Hank Hennigraf stuff I got years ago, but manuscript evidence of scripture uh, you know, one, you know, we, we have these, these copies of copies of copies and when we examine them, they're all so pure. It increases our faith in scripture, the archeological evidence of scripture, uh, where every time somebody tries to go disprove the Bible, they find out that the Bible is accurate in what it says, or the prophetic nature of scripture, where, where there are all these prophecies and everyone that's supposed to come true has boom, boom, boom. I mean, every single time is such a wonderful thing that God has given us in, in his word. And then some statistics, you know, it, what's, the, what's the possibility that all these things that we're talking about could have happened by random chance? Pretty, uh, pretty long shot, uh, a definite long shot, if you will. And so friends understand that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of, of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And I've seen us get read a bit. I might have gotten read by God's word. And I've seen our church sometimes struggle with as the word of God reads us and shows us uh, that sometimes uh, we're, we're not kind of tracking along the way we're supposed to. And, um, and it, but that's part of its character, part of the character of the word of God when you read it, part of the character of the word of God when it's preached is that it cuts, it is sharp. It, it, yeah, it soothes at times, thank the Lord. Yeah, but but, but it, it is a two-edged sword. It cuts both sides. And it gets you. But the the reason for that is so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ, which is who this is really all about in the first place. It's about Jesus. It's about him dying on the cross. It's about him rising from the dead. It's about those of us who receive that great salvation, walking according to scripture. And so I want to speak plainly and say that, that this is the view to hold, that scripture is authoritative and binding. And alongside that, please understand that God's word is not meant to harm or hurt or limit 
or any of that, but to liberate, to set free, to deliver, to bless. Every time it's, it's heralded, every time it's preached when, with love and, and grace and power, it is, it's, it's setting us free, even if it has to cut first to get a chain uh, dropped off and, and cut off. And one of the saddest things I've seen over the years is people turn their backs on sections of scripture. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly as it relates to family and gender and, uh, and some of the more hot cultural topics. Very few people in, in, in good churches go back on the deity of Christ, but a lot go back on, you know, how a marriage ought to operate. And that's, it's a sad thing to see. It's devastating too. Uh, so scripture is divine rather than human in origin, as Hank Hennigraf phrase from the old days. And so as a result, it not only soothes us, um, but, and saturates us with his love, but it also, it also brings conviction. Jesus said in Matthew uh, 4, 4, that man shall live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That is a declaration of the authoritative and binding nature of scripture. Binding sounds kind of negative, but what I mean is we are bound. We are commanded to keep the word of God. That's what I mean by binding. And so he's, our Lord here is quoting some Old Testament scripture you can read there, but Jesus essentially declared that our entire lives should be governed by the word of God. Our, our home lives, our personal lives, our self-governing, our ministry lives, our work lives, everything is governed by the word of God. And this is an important stone to make sure it's laid because I can't go to women in ministry and deal with that, that barrel of fish hooks without an understanding that, man, God's word governs that. He tells us what he wants in his church. He tells us what he doesn't want in church. I can't go to head covering a very historic doctrine that everyone believed until the 1960s. All the church everywhere, right? I can't go back over that again without this understanding that that doctrine comes from the word of God, that the Holy Spirit saw fit to include those, those many, many verses in 1 Corinthians 11 for our good, just like the verses after it about the Lord's table, just like the verses in the next chapter about gifts and every member being needful, uh, just like the verses in the next chapter about love that we love so much, just like the verses in the next chapter about gifts again and prayer and prophecy and tongues and, and so forth. I mean, it's all in there for our good. But if you don't see the word of God a certain way, if you don't see this book lovingly delivered to us, you know, by, by Christ, say, here's my heart for you. If you don't see that, um, man, it's really hard then. Now the world gets in and now someone went, went to Google and, and some, some article they found is saying why you don't have to be obedient to something. You know, and you lose the beauty. You lose the sense of how beautiful it is to obey scripture. And we all get it wrong. Don't, no one hear some kind of ungodly perfectionism in this talk. We all get it wrong at times. But there are some things that are really plain. And you know, sometimes we're just kind of in rebellion. We just, I don't like it. And there you go. Um, and it's really easy in the, in the culture in which we live because the things that have hurt our church over the years, we're kind of standing alone. And I'm not, I don't have a martyr's complex, but we kind of are in our cultural context. Um, so um, again, I feel like I have, I don't have anything to lose at this point. You know, I love you too much. love our church too much to just kind of let it dangle out there without speaking into it and trying to bring life out of it uh, by, by God's grace. And so Christians ought to be thirsty for God's word. Look, look, let, let's just read these verses. They're on the screen. So if you're watching and you won't be embarrassed, read, let's read it together. You ready? Here we go. Uh, Psalm 119, 48. I will lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, and they are the joy of my heart. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. All oh, the ways of the Lord are so good. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Delighting in the statutes. If church, church, church everywhere. Our church, your church, church down the street, church on the block. If we could get to, I delight in your statutes. I delight in the gospel. I delight in the marital regulations. I delight in the worship verses. I delight in the forgiveness verses. I delight in the repentance verses. I delight in the spiritual, the Holy Spirit verses. I delight in the prophecy verses. I delight, I delight, I delight. Oh, revival, revival, revival. 
<laughs> Hallelujah, revival. But Satan is working over time to cause us to look with disdain on very important parts of scripture. So there's a couple links there. Uh, my friend Vody, I say my friend, but yeah, he is my friend. We've, we've met a few times, talked a few times, had lunch. Just dropped his name, didn't I? Just just erase that part. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> but anyway, oh man, my friend Vody um, did a wonderful sermon. I hope that link's still there. You probably had just search on it and you'll find it on YouTube. Why I choose to believe the Bible by Vody Bakum. Really good stuff. Karm.org has some good stuff on this as well. A couple of good books as well on, on just the inspiration of scripture. And there are many. But uh, friends, I just, I just kind of want to drop this in there on you. And um, hopefully, you know, we can start this process of speaking clearly and plainly. There are other topics as well. It's not just the woman stuff. But it's on my mind right now because of um, just the, the personal suffering and the damage that it's done in our church. So I want to address it. Just want to throw it out there and to have a point of reference, you know, if, if there it is, uh, hopefully in love, hopefully in grace, but hopefully it, our view looks just like the Bible. That's the goal. Our view looks just like God's word. That's what we're trying to do. So thanks for hanging out with me for a few moments. Um, as you can see, I'm up on Zoom, just trying something a little different doing some Bible studies here as well with those of you who want to participate. So uh, this was installment one, installment two. Uh, we're going in. Love you guys.